Well, and thanks for the conveners of this conference for choosing such a beautiful spot for it and for you all sticking it out to the last uh, talk of the day. I'd also like to acknowledge my co-authors on this work I'll be talking about, uh, Ken Caldera, uh, Chris Green, and Marty Hoffert. So, you know, the title of this uh, session, I guess, is Bleeding Edge Science, and that's a little bit of a misnomer given what I'm going to talk about, uh, which is really uh, a revisitation of two papers in particular, um, this one being the first, uh, Marty Hoffert actually, and Ken, as well as Steve Schneider, whose name's come up, and uh, even Danny Harvey, who's in the audience, I guess, um, wrote this paper back in 1998, 15 years ago. And I gather it was actually inspired by a meeting just down the road at the Aspen uh, Global Change Institute. And then, uh, more recently, 10 years after the Hoffert paper, uh, Mike Rawpack and his colleagues at the Global Carbon Project uh, published this paper on uh, regional and global drivers of CO2 emissions. And so I'd argue, and I'll get into the details of what these papers said uh, in just a minute, but I'd argue that together these two papers really tell us a lot of what we need to know about both on the one hand the enormity of the carbon uh, climate challenge we're facing, as well as why exactly we're uh, failing in our efforts to do much about it. So I'll start with a retrospective of the Hoffert paper. And uh, the first thing those authors noted was that uh, and it's no less true today, climate change is essentially an energy problem. Uh, and that's because, of course, we depend upon fossil fuels for 85, 86 percent of our energy worldwide, and uh, the byproduct CO2 is, of course, the primary cause of climate change and all its attendant environmental harms. But, of course, beyond that, what they noted, and again, this paper was written 15 years ago in 1998, and around that time, uh, use of scenarios in climate change research was still a relatively new thing, uh, but there was a new set of scenarios that had just come out, um, among them a whole panoply of, of scenarios that were called business as usual scenarios, so ones that entailed no additional uh, climate policies, uh, as well as a set of scenarios that looked at what it would take to stabilize our atmospheric CO2 compositions at different levels. And so, even under the business as usual scenarios, which I'm going to highlight one here uh, that was kind of the favorite of the day called IS-92A, um, energy demand grows a lot over the course of the century. So by mid-century, for instance, that IS-92A uh, had us using 30 terawatts of primary power. Uh, and mind you, in 1998, when this paper was written, we were using around 11. So that's about a tripling over a 50-year period. And then uh, the other lines on this plot, so this is again showing you primary power over time. The WRE lines are a set of these stabilization scenarios uh, allowing atmospheric uh, CO2 levels to stabilize at those different numbers on there. And those lines are showing you the maximum amount of fossil energy that could be used to stabilize the climate at those different levels. So they flipped this around and they showed that in order then to meet those different stabilization scenarios, and even in the case of that business as usual scenario, we actually had to deploy a tremendous amount of carbon-free energy over the course of the 21st century. And they mapped this out. And so, you know, what I'm going to do today is show you how we've uh, made progress against these goals or not. So before I then tell you briefly about the raw pack paper, I think it's worth taking a minute to explain uh, what I think is a really valuable conceptual framework that both of these papers relied upon. And it'll be familiar to some of you, but maybe not everyone, and perhaps everyone could use a refresh. This is called the Kaya identity. And so what it's saying is that fossil fuel emissions, which are F on the left there, are equal to population times GDP per capita times the energy intensity of GDP times the carbon intensity of energy. And so if you think of each of these factors in the, at the right, each of the terms, as a different lever we might have for reducing fossil fuel emissions, F, you can kind of walk through them uh, in your mind and you can say, well, it's really hard to govern population. We know this, uh, you know, short of authoritarian policies, which aren't wildly popular, there's not a whole lot you can do about that. And in fact, the best way we have for reducing population growth is in fact to increase that second term, GDP per capita. And that's because people tend to have fewer children, the more likely the survival of their children is, and so when they're doing better economically, they have access to medical care, nutrition, so forth, their children tend to live, and so population growth declines. 
So what this means in a world where there's a lot of people still in developing nations is that these two first terms are likely to grow steadily throughout the century. Which leaves us with these last two terms as our key levers for trying to reduce fossil fuel emissions. Uh, and so that third term, the energy intensity of GDP, is the unit of energy, uh, or per unit energy, how much uh, dollar of GDP do we get out of it? You could think of it as the efficiency of an economy. And so what the Hoffert paper essentially did was look at those scenarios, and they found that the expected growth of population and, and uh, economies worldwide would outstrip the decreases expected in that efficiency term, the energy intensity of GDP, such that the only way we had to stabilize CO2 in the climate was to decrease drastically the last term, that carbon intensity of energy, and thus those massive amounts of carbon-free power I showed in the plot. So fast forward a decade, and this is the paper by Mike Ropak and his colleagues who've been assiduously monitoring annual CO2 emissions, and they noticed around 2002 that not only were annual emissions increasing, but the rate of their increase was increasing. They were accelerating. And so they dug in a little bit to see what was causing that. And they used the Kaya terms that I was just outlining for you. So this plot is showing between 1980 and 2004, everything is normalized to equal one in 1990, how these things changed over time. And so in the red, you see population steadily increasing. In the orange, you can see GDP per capita is doing more or less the same. Uh, the black line shows you there in the end the steepening, the acceleration of emissions. That's emissions in black. And, and all of that was sort of expected, but the, the one thing that was unexpected that they were able to focus on was that the long-term trend of decreases in the carbon intensity of energy that we were using, as well as that energy intensity of GDP, how efficient we were with our economy, were actually turning around. They seemed to be increasing themselves. And they looked a little deeper and did some regional analysis, and they found that that was mostly attributable to the economic development, the rapid economic development in places like China that was mostly, mostly dependent on coal. So those terms were, were called out at that point. So now I'm going to show you what we've been doing uh, in the years since. So this is more or less a, a, a revisitation of that Hoffert plot that I first showed you of what primary energy over time is doing. I've cropped it to just be to 2050. And you've got in the black line there at the top the, the old business as usual scenario and then the stabilization scenarios beneath that in blue. And so what we've been doing is actually using more energy than we even expected under business as usual. Uh, and that, you know, it's, it's a little surprising, but it's not in and of itself a bad thing if we're able to generate that excess energy using carbon-free energy sources. So let's take a look at how that's been going. This is carbon-free primary energy over time. So it's reversed. The business, as usual, is on the bottom. The more uh, aggressive mitigation stabilization scenarios are at the top. And what have we been doing? We're actually deploying less carbon-free energy than was expected under business as usual back in 1998, which is a little depressing and doubly bad since we're using more energy than we thought we would. So it follows then, as you might expect, that carbon emissions are actually above where uh, we expected that they would be back in 1998. In this case, I've added in those gold lines uh, realizations of the new RCPs of the IPCC. And you can see that observations, this is out to 2010, um, we're already above even the RCP 8.5 uh, as of 2010, which is pretty shocking. So looking at those intensity terms relative to the raw pack paper, what I'm showing here in the black is the, the energy intensity of GDP over time that was expected in that business as usual scenario. And then the yellow again is the RCPs. Um, and what we're doing is actually in red, and so it's, it's a little hard to make out on here, but more or less since 2000, 2002, energy intensity of GDP isn't decreasing very much. It's mostly flat. Um, and so that's interesting to compare then with those RCP realizations, which actually show continued decreases out through mid-century in all cases. So they're expecting us to turn this around, but it's not obvious that we will. Uh, on the other hand, that increase in carbon intensity that Raw Pack et al. found is actually persisting. We've been increasing the carbon intensity of our energy supply uh, for the last 10 years, really. And right now, we're above even where we were in 1985. 
Uh, and so in the case of the RCPs here, again, you can compare and see that uh, three of the four of them anticipate pretty uh, dramatic decreases in carbon intensity of energy uh, out through mid-century. And in fact, three of the four are below the carbon intensity of natural gas uh, by 2050. And only the RCP 8.5 is above. So the last plot that I'll show you is looking at what you often hear about decarbonization. And so it's a little bit tricky because it's, uh, the decarbonization refers to the, the quotient of carbon dioxide emissions over GDP. So it's really the product of those other two intensities that we've been talking about, uh, the carbon intensity of energy and the energy intensity of GDP. If you multiply them together, the energies cancel out. And that's where we talk about decarbonization. So you can actually look at scenarios and see what's the implied rate of decarbonization over time. Uh, and so what I've got on here in green is those range of old stabilization scenarios. And so on the left, for instance, the WRE 350 would have had us stabilize atmospheric CO2 at 350. Uh, and so it's saying we needed about 5.5% year-on-year decreases in the carbon intensity of our economy to, to reach that kind of stabilization. A less aggressive one, 650, 750 out there, are at a percent, a percent and a half. Now, mind you, if GDP is growing 2 to 3% a year, which is basically what all the economies in the world want to do, then the 350, for instance, would have entailed 8.5% absolute decreases in CO2 emissions year after year. And so all of these are averaged over what those scenarios implied between 1985 and 2050. So if I add on the RCPs here, you can see that RCP 2.6 is out on the left, and that's the one that people think maybe could allow us to stabilize the climate at 1.3 to 2.5 is basically the range. Uh, it's around 4.5% decarbonization. And of course, you go up to the RCP 8.5 there at the right, and it's a little less than one or a half. So that old business as usual I've added in blue is still over a percent of decarbonization every year. And then if I show you what we've done, 1985 to 2010 averaged is less than a percent. So we're, we're worse than the business as usual scenario. And if we actually only look at the last decade, this is where the title of my talk comes in, we're actually recarbonizing the economy. And so, you know, not to depress anyone too much, but <laughs> this, is a, this is a global problem. And if I wanted to tie it back to what we're talking about in this conference, I would say that, you know, just as important as talking to people about the reality of climate change as a problem, we need to be prepared to talk to those same people as a community about what options we have for dealing with this problem and emphasizing that we're going in the wrong direction, really outlining paths for them um, of how we can get on the right track. And so I know a lot of you have probably read about how emissions in the U.S. and Europe are down in recent years, and we could have an entire other conference on what that is all about, uh, whether it's outsourcing CO2 or the recession or if it's cheap gas uh, and how persistent those reductions are liable to be. But what I've shown you today is a global analysis to a global problem, and it's showing we're moving in the wrong direction. So uh, we need to communicate this as well and try to get back on track. Thanks.